All right, thank you all for watching. Today we're going to talk about Final Cut Pro 10 versus Premiere Pro CS6. Now the first question you're probably asking yourself is why are we doing this? Well, there's a few reasons. The first is our current suite will be over five years old by next term. Now there was a newer version, Final Cut Pro Studio 3, which came out. It had Final Cut Pro 7 in it in 2009, but we chose not to go with that because the cost did not really justify at the time the amount of new features that came out with it. Because of the changes in OS 10.7 and in the future with OS 10.8, which is called Mountain Line, the architecture that is required for Final Cut Pro 6 to be installed is no longer supported. So they switched over a few years ago from a PowerPC architecture to an Intel architecture. There was, for a short period of time, up until the current version that we're using, which is called Snow Leopard, the ability to use both PowerPC code and Intel code. In 10.7 and above, they're just using Intel-based code and the installer for Final Cut Pro Studio 2 or Final Cut Pro 6 is basically PowerPC code. We can't stay on Snow Leopard, which is what we're currently running for any longer because Apple's new release computers cannot be downgraded to 10.6. So the big question is, we're not going to move away from Macintosh, what are our options? Avid Media Composer, Final Cut Pro 10, and Premiere Pro CS6. Now because of proprietary formats and overall bang for the buck, we have eliminated the Avid Media Composer from the suite. So it's just between Final Cut Pro 10 and Premiere Pro CS6. Let's talk about the key features for each of these. One of the number one key features with Final Cut Pro 10 is autosave. So it, it is automatically saving every single edit and cut that you make. You don't actually have to save your project any longer because it's doing it for you. Next up is background rendering, whereas before in Final Cut Pro 6 and 7, you had to watch that render bar come up and you were just stuck there. Now the rendering is in the background. Database organization, including auto shots, which allows basically does the organization for you and the ability to auto-analyze and fix shaky shots and bowed sound. There's also this really unique function called the Liquid Timeline, which I will demonstrate in a minute, and the ability to audition different editing choices. Now let's take a look at Premiere Pro CS6's key features. One of the ones is a strong integration with After Effects CS6 and the rest of the Adobe suite. The tools are similar in all Adobe apps, so people coming from Illustrator, Photoshop, and InDesign are going to be very familiar with what the tools look like. Strong emphasis on keyboard use and shortcuts, facial detection, and a full workflow solution from script to screen has been integrated within Premiere Pro CS6. You can actually write all of your stuff in an Adobe application and edit it and finish it all the way through with the Premiere Pro and CS6 bundle. Now as I mentioned previously, we are moving from Final Cut Pro Studio to Final Cut Pro or Premiere Pro. What this means is there's a few applications that have been lost from the Studio set. And I'm going to go in over each one of these and talk about what the possible options are for replacement. The first one is Cinema Tools. Now this is an application that allows you to go from film to video and then video back to actually physically cutting a film. This is something that I'm almost positive that not a single student here at PNCA used. And with everything going towards digital cinema, I don't think it's going to be missed at all. Next up is Color, which is a grading suite. It allows you to color correct your footage and also put in a overall look or color to your production. This was something that was acquired by Apple in the Final Cut Pro Studio 2 that we have and it was refined further in Final Cut Pro Studio 3. All of the main features of this have been rolled into Final Cut Pro X or Final Cut Pro 10 and Adobe has come out with a new application that's available in the production bundle which is called SpeedGrade which allows you to do that type of thing. This is something that really wasn't used that often by our students but I think both applications have a solution for that. 
Next up is motion, which is a, Apple's kind of answer to After Effects. It's something that never really took hold in any of our classes and really hasn't taken hold in the industry. The one thing that I really used it for when I was teaching classes was the use of green screen and the superior slow motion. Both of those features have been integrated into Final Cut Pro 10 and in Premiere Pro they are integrated into either After Effects or Premiere itself. Compressor is something that is used to compress the video down for output. This is something that I think caused a lot of problems for students previously. I always see them very confused by it. A lot of the features of this have been rolled into Final Cut Pro 10. Adobe Premiere Pro has something called the Adobe Media Encoder that does a very similar job to this. Both Motion and Compressor have $50 options that are available in the App Store if there is any need for those. One of the other things that Compressor was used for was to prepare stuff for DVD Studio Pro. That was only in the version 1 and the version that we have I think is version 4 or 5 but it's something that I think some people still think you need to use to get into DVD Studio Pro. This is something else that is leaving us. Now there are a few different options for this depending on if we go with Final Cut Pro 10 or if we go with Premiere Pro CS6. Let's look at the option for Final Cut Pro 10 first. Now we can always use iDVD which is very good at being able to export things out for looping and for autoplaying. It's something that actually I see most students use. The one thing that we're losing with Premiere Pro Studio that iDVD can't do is the ability to make better DVDs for portfolios, etc. Final Cut Pro 10 also has the ability to make a very simple DVD from directly within the application. It can support autoplay, but currently as far as I can tell, it does not support looping, which is kind of a detriment. I imagine that this is something that will be added in the near future. Part of the Adobe Premiere production bundle would be the Adobe Encore application. And this is something that gives us a lot more flexibility and control over our video than iDVD does. So this is a very similar product to and a very simple replacement to DVD Studio Pro. This also allows you to burn Blu-ray discs and Final Cut Pro 10 also allows you to burn Blu-ray discs as well. We do need an external Blu-ray burner as no Macintosh computer supports Blu-ray burning internally. So what's the verdict? I actually believe that both of these options are pretty good. If we really really want to make nice portfolio DVDs then I believe that Adobe Encore has the edge. But if we look at the way things are going, everything's going towards digital editing and then digital delivery. I was just watching a interview with Walter Murch who is a really well-known editor and he believes that this is the way things are going as well. More and more movie productions are using digital projectors to project out and deliver their film footage. So I believe that the disc media is something that in a few years is not even going to be around or applicable. Next up, and I think one of our biggest losses, is going to be Soundtrack Pro. Soundtrack Pro was used in beginning video and sound as a step up from GarageBand. Its replacement will be used in the new beginning sound class. Now here are the options we have. For Final Cut Pro 10, we have the option of also purchasing Logic Pro. This is a professional music creation suite. Most music that you've heard on the radio that was made within the past four or five years was probably done on Logic Pro. It's the professional industry standard, and as you can see, the interface is very, very similar to the old Soundtrack Pro. On Adobe's side, we have Adobe Audition. Audition is also a very comparable player and as you can see it's very very similar in the way that it looks to Logic Pro. In my research it's something that people use because it's around but it's not really an industry standard. It's just a nice addition. The overall verdict for me would be cost being no option Logic Pro. The interface is a little bit more refined and it is the industry standard. It also gives a little bit more flexibility in the creation of music and soundscapes, which is something that it looks like the sound program of the video and sound is going more towards. Now another question you might be asking yourself is what about 
the old Final Cut Pro 6 and 7 projects. Well, don't worry. Final Cut Pro 10, when it first came out, there was a big, big complaint that you couldn't upgrade your projects from Final Cut Pro 6 or 7. There is a small $10 application called X to 7 and 7 to X that allows you to go to both back and forth between the two. Adobe Premiere Pro actually supports the importing of Final Cut Pro 7's XML format, so it automatically can import the footage right off the bat. Something else that I wanted to look at was what problems do our students run into? One of the first things that I've noticed when I am teaching this to my classes is that when you open up Final Cut Pro for the first time, it's an interface overload. There's a lot of buttons that allow you to do the same thing over and over and over again. Now this is what it looks like when you open up a standard project, but if students kind of go a little bit crazy as they're often apt to do, it can eventually kind of degrade into something that looks like this. And what I've done here is I've actually opened up all the windows that are possible and kind of mushed them around. But I've seen things similar to this oftentimes. The good news is both applications have done a lot to try to keep everything within one window. This is the default look for Final Cut Pro 10. And this is actually the most complex you can make it. A lot of these planes slide in and out depending on what you're doing. So this, some of these panes could be replaced with audio monitoring or with color correction, but it pretty much does a very good job of making sure that you can never get overburdened with the amount of panes. This is the default interface for Premiere Pro. Something that they're really proud of with the new CS6 version is they've gotten rid of a lot of the distractions. But with this being an Adobe product, there are a lot, a lot of palettes. Now this is something that I doubt anybody would ever do, but you can see the amount of complexity that you can get into with the Premiere Pro interface. Now one of the things that I would say in its favor is with all of these different palettes, you can really customize your interface to make it really work well for you. You have a little bit more control over it than you would with Final Cut Pro 10. In my opinion though, with our students, I think the simplicity and ease of the interface in Final Cut Pro 10 wins over the amount of control and the amount of customization that's available in Premiere Pro CS6. So I would go with Final Cut Pro 10 on this option. The next problem that students can run into is importing from tape. Now whenever I'm in class, I take an entire day to teach students how to import from tape. Yes, we are eventually going to be running over and hopefully be getting card-based cameras in the near future, but it's going to take a while for us to get rid of all the tape-based cameras. So for the next one or two years, we're still going to be stuck with tape. Now what I've done is I went through and I took a tape and I recorded it with our SD camera and our HD camera in all the different formats. I also put in gaps of tape where there was nothing recorded and I switched to all the different formats throughout. So this is probably a worst case scenario. I then put it into our HD camera and imported it. Now the importing interface with Final Cut Pro 10 is very similar to iMovie. There's a camera, you click on it, and you just hit the import button. Now one of the things that Final Cut Pro 10 has gotten rid of is the ability for you to do logging and capturing. It's just going to capture everything in from the tape. And then it expects you to go in and organize it afterwards. So if you click on the import button right there, it does an excellent job. When it went from DV to HD, it just switched over. It knew exactly what was happening. It stopped importing when the tape was blank, and then it brought things right in afterwards. This is a huge improvement over Final Cut Pro 7. On the other end is Premiere Pro. This is much more similar to what we're used to with the, the ability to log and capture, set your in and out points, and then do a batch capture afterwards that you get with Final Cut Pro 6 and 7. You can also import the entire tape and have it do an automatic scene detection as well. But in my experience, it's only going to import your HD or DV footage. It doesn't import both of them. And something that was really troubling to me, when I went from DV footage to HD, I got this error message that popped up. And even more upsetting was the fact that I could not get rid of this. I clicked on OK and it would have pop up again. I did everything in my power. I turned off the camera, I unplugged it, but I could not get rid of this error message. The only way to get rid of it was to force quit out of the application. For students, this is going to be very, very upsetting because Premiere Pro does not auto-save your application 
does not autosave your product. So when they open it, it's going to look like all the footage that they'd imported previously has was lost or deleted. That's not the case. Just like in Final Cut Pro 6 and 7, you can go to the scratch disk or wherever it's at and you can re-import the footage. But it's going to cause some problems for students. Hands down between these two, the option for importing from tape goes straight to Final Cut Pro 10. It is the best choice of the two. Another one is Media Offline. We see this all the time, and this is almost always a product of our students' disorganization. Now, if we take a look at what Final Cut Pro 10 offers, it's actually one of the more controversial, but I think a real big benefit for our students. It actually has a database. Now, one of the downsides to this is students are going to be required, each database is going to be done on a by disk. So students are going to be required to have an external hard drive. They're not going to be able to edit off the student work drive as they did before because whoever is the first person to edit off the student work drive has those permissions and all other students trying to use that computer will not be able to edit off of it. So all students are going to be required to have an external hard drive to import their media to. The good thing about this is I've tested USB 2.0 drives and they work perfectly fine so we don't have to worry about the added expense of final of firewire drives this also um, so the really nice thing about this is all of the footage that they've brought in is organized for them and condensed into that database we get rid of any problems we might have where for instance if they put in a CD and drag it drag the music directly off the CD into the timeline, it's expecting to have that CD there all the time, and then when they go in to play it again, the CD's been popped out, it's lost that footage. With the amount of organization I've seen, I'm sure you've seen on some of our students' desktops, the choice that Final Cut Pro 10 has made to organize the footage for our students, I think is going to be great for them and going to be a huge boon. They also allows them to organize and tag their footage, which is something I think more and more people are getting used to through the internet. Once again, going the, in the exact opposite direction is Premiere Pro. Premiere Pro is going to bring in anything from anywhere. If you bring in your audio files from a CD, it's assuming that you know that that's what you've done. So it's putting a lot more responsibility on the editor to know and organize the information for themselves. This is a positive if you have really organized students and people who are using a preset pipeline, but for our students who are just learning and honestly a lot of them don't have the greatest organizational skills, this is going to be a problem. One of the downsides to the way that Final Cut Pro 10 works is if you try to organize anything within that database folder structure, it will really upset Final Cut Pro. If you want to delete any footage or if you want to add any footage or additional projects, you need to, in Final Cut Pro 10, do it through Final Cut Pro 10 itself. With that being said, I still think that the, the trade-off for being able to only organize within Final Cut Pro 10 and the fact that you have to have an external hard drive, I think still gives the, the amount of organization that it does for the students and how it collects all the footage into that one place definitely for our students gives Final Cut Pro 10 the edge over Premiere Pro. Next up is preferences corruption. So a lot of times some really weird things will happen and the only way that I know how to fix them is to go in and to delete the preferences within Final Cut Pro 6 and 7. And this is something I'm sure all of you have run into before. The truth of the matter is between these two I've done a little bit of research and honestly they're both a lot more stable applications than Final Cut Pro 6 and 7. From what I've seen online and in different forums, aside from the interface issues that some people have with Final Cut Pro 10 being so different in how the editing works, um, both of them seem to be a lot more stable than Final Cut Pro 6 or 7. And that would make sense since they're a lot newer. Um, the one issue that I've said before with both of these that we can run into problems with with Premiere Pro is that bringing footage in from tape if you're going from DV to HD and with Final Cut Pro 10 would be in any way or shape or form messing with the file structure of the database outside of Final Cut Pro 10. Next up is editing gaps. So a lot of times students like to move their footage around on the timeline like they would be moving 
around p pictures or images on a piece of paper. This is something that I've seen a lot of students really like to do as opposed to use the keyboard shortcuts. With that comes the problems of sometimes having these small one to two frame gaps where the footage has been kind of moved. Now the reason for this is that Final Cut Pro 6 and 7 both were made for people who are doing commercials or for television productions where they really want to respect the overall time of the footage. If you delete something it's going to leave a gap there because they it's assuming that if you're doing a 30 second commercial it wants to keep it at 30 seconds. One of the biggest improvements I think for our students and one of the biggest issues a lot of professional editors have is what's known as this liquid editing which basically allows you to move your footage around and it will not allow you to have any gaps. It's saying if you want a gap in this footage you're actually going to have to choose to put it in there through a menu. This for our students I think is great. It allows them to move the footage back and forth all around without any problems or any worries that they're going to have these small little editing chunks out of there. Now both Final Cut Pro 7 and Premiere Pro have the ability for you to go and choose something that says get rid of gaps, but it's something that a lot of students forget how to forget is available to them. Also with the addition of the ability to audition different clips, I think that Final Cut Pro has a lot of really great features for our students. Premiere Pro, on the other hand, is really going to stay to trying to keep and respect the overall time of the timeline. So if you delete something, it's going to leave a gap. If you're moving things around and don't butt them right next to each other, there's the ability to have the gaps as well. Once again, for our students, I think between these two, the improvements to Final Cut Pro 10 are going to be a benefit for them. A lot of times they're not making necessarily strict narrative vehicles. They're trying to see how shots would be before or after something and the ease of use and the ease and ability to move those different clips around on the timeline I think are going to make them very happy and it's going to allow them to make more productive work. Next up, and I'm sure we've run into one or two people with this every single class, you show them how to do keyframes in six, Final Cut Pro 6 or 7, and somebody, one of them, is going to just go off, and suddenly there is a video that's going to take multiple days to render. Or you come into a class and there is a computer with a white piece of paper taped over it that says rendering please do not touch. And that means that either some students who maybe need to use that computer aren't going to use that computer or they have to stop the students rendering. Both cases are bad news. Now what Final Cut Pro 10 has done is they've pushed all of their rendering to the background. So things are always going to be rendering in the background. It's very very good about pausing the rendering and then bring it back up if resources are needed for playback for instance. And what it's going to do is it's basically if it's got a very very complex clip it can show you stuff frame by frame but it will choose to basically degrade the quality of the playback or eventually go choppy as opposed to just showing you a needs to be rendered option. And both applications are using the power of these very strong video cards to help render these things out. Premiere Pro, on the other hand, has um, does not have background rendering, but has really, really um, optimized something called the Mercury Playback Engine to make sure that things can play back in real time as much as possible. The other really big thing that it has over Final Cut Pro 10 is its strong integration with After Effects. You can actually take some clips, send them to After Effects, and do something that's known as dy dynamic linking. You can update these new projects in After Effects and they will automatically link back to Premiere Pro. It's a wonderful system and it's really, really fast. For their, those students who are really into these highly complex effects, they're going to really appreciate this option here. So between these two, for students who want to do really complex effects, I think the winner is going to be Premiere Pro with its integration with After Effects. Next is exporting. Now there's always been a lot of confusion with students. Do I export this as a QuickTime movie? Do I use Compressure? Do I use QuickTime Conversion? What are all these different options? With Final Cut Pro 10, they actually have more windows than Premiere Pro. But they've made these windows into a much more graphical interface. So you can see that they can go to a regular media file, to YouTube, or even to Blue Disk, which was something I was talking about earlier. This makes it really simple for students to choose what they want to export to. 
On the other hand, Premiere Pro gives an amazing amount of options for export. Here's just a small part of the list, but as you can see, the amount of different options you have, which is you can see there's like seven or eight different ones for Vimeo alone, is going to cause overall complexity and confusion for our students. I think they're going to be like, I just want to send something to Vimeo. Do I need to choose a 10.8p25 or 29.97? So in my opinion, between these two, even though there's a few more actual windows, the ease and clarity with the exporting for Final Cut Pro 10 wins out. The next few things are things that are actually done by our students in camera. So let's start off with unsteady shots. No matter how much we tell our students that they need to use a tripod, sometimes they're just going to get so much into the shooting that they're going to forget or they just don't want to put it on a tripod. So we have some different options. What Final Cut Pro 10 chooses to do is when you're inputting your footage, it gives you this list of different things you can check, including video and audio options to analyze to fix problems with them. One of those is stabilization. Premiere Pro also has something called a warp stabilizer, which works very well. I've tested both of them and they, they stabilize things out just about as good both ways. It's a tie between the two. The Warp stabilizer is something that's basically saying, I'm not going to take the time in the front end to analyze these shots. I'm just going to assume that you're going to know which needs to be steadied, and then I will steady it for you. You can apply this effect afterwards. So with these two, I think it's really a tie. I would give a slight edge to Final Cut Pro 10 just because it automatically analyzes it ahead of time and in the background. And then all you need to do is just click on the steady clip and it will do it for you. With both of these, when you have to steady a shot that's kind of got a little bit of jiggle and jitter to it, it's going to crop it in just a little bit. So this automatically shows you what the crop in is. Bad audio. This is something else that can just happen because a lot of our students are one-man bands or whatever. So both applications, Final Cut Pro 10 and Premiere Pro through Adobe Audition, have the ability to go in and clean up these things. I would give, once again, just a little bit of an edge to Final Cut Pro 10 because it analyzes the stuff ahead of time and fixes it for you, as opposed to making the student recognize it and fix it. Something else that students are going to run into is this footage that's out of focus. Now, unfortunately, neither application has a good solution to this. And really, nothing has a good solution to this other than people shooting stuff in focus. Something else to look into is I want to think about what types of different types of videos do our students make. So one is animation. And for, anima for animation students, something I'll see oftentimes is they'll go through, take a whole bunch of pictures with a digital still camera, they'll bring that into Final Cut Pro 6 or 7, and then they'll go through and slice each individual frame down to one or two frames. This is incredibly, incredibly time consuming and annoying. Uh, something that they can always do is just bring it into a QuickTime Pro and export and bring it in as an image sequence and export it out as a video. But sometimes students don't know that. Final Cut Pro 10 does not have that option. It can export image sequences. What's really nice with Premiere Pro is it allows you to bring in your footage, a whole bunch of just separate images in as an image sequence and editing it as a whole clip. The other big thing that Premiere Pro has going for it in animation is the ability, as I said before, to export stuff out to After Effects. So I think for students who are editing primarily, primarily animations, Premiere Pro CS6 is the winner, hands down. Art video. Now I've broken art video down into two separate types. These are very broad categories, but basically they're the ones that are much more about composition, production value, and the look of what's in front of the camera. Things similar to maybe Matthew Barney or in the Cray Master Cycle. Or we've got other, the other end of the spectrum where things are much more in your face, more do it yourself, more visceral, people in makeup, the, the camera's a little bit more shaky, things are a little bit more low budget, the production values are probably a little bit less. Stuff like Ryan Tricartan's pieces. Now, if we look at both of these, I would actually say that different editors are going to be helpful for different students in this way. So, for those students who want to do highly produced videos, the integration with After Effects and the extra bit of control that you have with Premiere Pro would be 
beneficial to them. For people who are doing more DIY stuff where the camera might be shaky, where they don't really have a complete idea of what they're shooting and need that additional organization, I think Final Cut Pro 10 is the helpful option. Next is documented performance. So these are pieces that where the student is actually really doing a performance piece and they're documenting it and calling it video art. Oftentimes the student is the one who's doing the actual performance and they're getting a friend to videotape for them. In this situation sometimes the use of a tripod is not optimal or it's just a documented performance so people are really really concentrating on trying to get the performance down and then we come back and look that the footage might not be white balanced or properly stabilized. So with this, once again, I think Final Cut Pro 10 is going to be helpful with the options to automatically fix those things through analyzation. Next up, documentary and narrative. This is something that a lot of schools, that's their main bread and butter, but it's only a small option for us here at PNCA. Once again, I think it's sort of a tie, but I think in documentary, particularly with the added organizational skills that come in with Final Cut Pro 10, I would give them a slight edge. Found and recontextualized footage. So this is something where the student hasn't actually shot the footage. They're bringing it in from something separate like YouTube, archive.org, or from a DVD or videotape. With these particular type of projects, we often see the footage strewn everywhere. The students are really just trying to work and collage things together to see what works. And oftentimes, the last thing on their mind is organizing their footage before they do that. For this reason, I think that Final Cut Pro 10 is going to be a huge boon for them. They can take the stuff down, import it in, and it's automatically part of that database. The other thing is the ability to kind of compare footage side by side as we have in this clip here where for instance you might have a 1950s housewife next to some sort of pornography or something like that. With both of these applications, both Premiere Pro and Final Cut Pro 10, the ability to crop down and put multiple layers works perfectly well. I would give just a slight edge in that instance to Premiere Pro because of its integration with After Effects. But for the overall flow and the ability to go through and edit different things together, see how things look side by side, one after the other, I'm going to give the award here and the choice and preference to Final Cut Pro 10 because of the fact that it brings all the media together. Next up we have manipulated FX manipulated video, which is basically video where there's very strong emphasis on FX to the point where it's possibly collage or manipulation of the signal. With this, hands down, the option is going to be Premiere Pro because of its integration with After Effects. This, it, there's just really no question about it. There are some really nice, nice, nice options of effects in Final Cut Pro 10 but it is somewhat limited and to get some really intense effects they're going to have to go over to After Effects and the integration that Premiere Pro has with that gives it a huge bonus in that option. Next up is music video and music video also can rely heavily on effects so I would say I would give a slight edge in this option to Premiere Pro. The next question is how do our students make video and this is really important. Some schools really emphasize on production video where you are going to be one person, one part of a large production flow. Most of our students however are one man bands. They are going to shoot, edit, and create most other projects all by themselves with very very minimal crews if any. For this reason, I think that all of the organization and all of the things that Final Cut Pro 10 helps you with gives it a slight edge there. So another question is, what is everyone else doing? What is the film industry and television industry doing? Well, as I said, Final Cut Pro 10 made a huge, huge decision when it chose to not honor the overall length of the timeline, to expand it or decrease it depending on what clip was being put on there. That was one of the biggest problems I think most industry professionals have with it. So honestly, what most people are doing is they are just waiting and seeing what's going to happen. They're either sticking with Final Cut Pro 10 or with Avid.
There is a well-known uh, special effects guy by the name of Alex Lindsay who's gone and worked and consulted on a number of different movies, and he said that most production houses have one computer in the back that has Final Cut Pro 10 on it. People play with it, but they're just sticking with what they're comfortable with, what works well with their workflow. A lot of these different companies have huge, huge workflows where multiple people are working on something and the change to Final Cut Pro 10 for these large production companies is a big, big step for them. What are the ACAD schools doing? Well, Michael did a really nice thing for me. He went out, he uh, asked a whole bunch of schools, and these are the responses we've gotten back. The Montserrat uh, College of the Arts is still kind of deciding. They're not 100% sure. At the time of me making this video, they were waiting on a demo from Apple on Final Cut Pro 10. SAIC is choosing to use Premiere Pro for the intro level classes and the upper level classes are going to be using both Final Cut Pro 7 and Final Cut Pro 10. The California College of Art also is going to have Premiere for their first year programs and they're just going to hold out on Final Cut Pro Studio 7. The Cooper Union is basically allowing student is going to have all three applications on all of their computers and just they're still going to mainly it seems like teach Final Cut Pro Studio and once again all of these colleges have this option because they probably chose to go with Final Cut Pro 7 so that still works on Lion and the next generation Mountain Lion we do not have that option because we have one version slightly older and the College of Creative Studies is actually going with Avid. Another thing to consider with this is cost. So Final Cut Pro 10. Final Cut Pro 10 is available from the Mac App Store at $300. There's no educational discount. And then we would also need an audio application. That would be Logic Pro at $200 from the Mac App Store. Overall, $500. If we wanted to add in the additions of Motion or Compressor, those are both $50 each, so it would be a total of $600 or $550 if we just wanted one of those two. Premiere Pro CS6. Currently, we have the Adobe Web and Design Suite, which is $550. We would be upgrading to the Adobe Master Suite, which would allow us to have Premiere Pro in addition to Adobe Encore and Adobe Audition, as well as Speed Grade, which is the thing that allows us to do color. That would be $800 per seat, and this is going to be a total of $250. All of the different costs that I'm getting here for Adobe are coming right off the Adobe website. I'm not sure if we are getting a special deal or anything with this, so the, ch the price might be a slight bit different. On the other end, for our students and for faculty, you can be a part of the Adobe Creative Cloud subscription. A one-year contract is required, but then it's only $30 per month, and you get access to everything which is in the Creative Suite, which also includes Adobe Photoshop, Adobe Illustrator, InDesign, etc. That's going to be a total of $350 per year with the one-year contract. Once a subscription is done, though, you can no longer use those applications, so it's $350 per year. How does this all break down? Well, Final Cut Pro and Logic seem to update every two to three years. That's going to be at $500. Premiere Pro is part of the Adobe Suite and that updates every single year. They've said that their cycle is going to be a 12 to 13 month cycle. If we take the split the difference between 2 to 3, 2.5, that equals out to approximately $200 a year for Adobe for Final Cut Pro and Logic or $195 a year for Adobe Premiere Pro CS6. Once students are graduated, this is where things really change. It's still going to be $300 plus $200 from the App Store, the same price that we pay for our graduated students to get those professional apps. If our students want to upgrade to the professional Adobe apps after college from the educational versions, it's going to be $800 just for Premiere and then an additional $350 for, for Audition, which is $1,150 total. Or if they want to get the production suite, which would also include Photoshop and After Effects and Speed Grade, that's going to be $1,900. Or they can also choose to go with the Creative Cloud option, which is $75 per month or $50 per month with a one year required subscription. So the end conclusion, which one do I recommend? 
Well, here's what we've kind of gone over. This is a little chart I've made. You can see that with interface, media import, media organization, and editing gaps, as well as exporting the media, I'm going to be recommending Final Cut Pro 10. For complex effects, I'm choosing Premiere Pro. And for camera smoothing, audio problems, and focus, I'm saying that those are ties. Over on what type of video students make, animation goes to Premiere Pro because of its integration with After Effects. Art video is a tie, depending on what the production value they want to go with. Documentary, documented, found and run recontextualized footage go to Final Cut Pro 10. And manipulated and heavy effects footage goes to Premiere, with music video being a tie. Other institutions, ACAD is kind of all over the place, most of them choosing to just buy everything with most of their emphasis just kind of sticking with Final Cut Pro Studio. And television as film are sticking with Final Cut Pro Studio, once again an option that we cannot do when we move over to the new operating system in the 2013-2014 term. Or they're going with Avid. Cost, once again, $200 per year per seat for us, for both us as a college and for students. It pretty much equals out. For a graduated student, however, the cost is significantly less for them to go with Final Cut Pro 10. So my choice would be for us to go with Final Cut Pro 10 and Logic. Now, this is not a choice that I've made lightly. When I first started using Final Cut Pro 10, I am someone who has used nonlinear editing since it first came out with the Avid, moved into Final Cut Pro 1 all the way through. I like to use keyboard shortcuts, which is something that Premiere Pro actually has an advantage in. I did not like using Final Cut Pro 10. You have to sit with it for a while if you have already used a and have experience with a previous professional nonlinear editor. It takes a little bit of time for you to get used to it. In my experience, and once I did get used to it though, I think that our students who have never used any version of Final Cut Pro or Premiere Pro previous to this are going to love it. If we go back and look at the student problems, you can see how many of those problems Final Cut Pro 10 has gone in and fixed. This is going to take a lot of time away from us as instructors troubleshooting problems and giving those students a lot more time to edit and learn how to fine tune and cut their edits. So it's going to be a little bit more work for us as instructors to, to relearn how to use this program. But I think the benefits are going to far outweigh the negatives. Now, we are taking a gamble with this. There are a few things that we have to trust Apple is going to do to update this. There are a few things that I want them to do, which is stronger integration with the keyboard, keeping editing marks set, and stronger and stronger ability to export and import things out. But I do believe that they're going to do that in all of the industry talk that I've looked at and spent my time looking at. They really, really are putting a lot of emphasis on making sure the professionals like this. I think right now we're at a crossroads. As we were back in the mid-90s when there were a lot of people that were editing on Steinbeck's and actually cutting film and they did not want to move over to nonlinear editing. Those people, there were younger people that kind of came up, they didn't know anything about Steinbeck's, they understood computers, and they took over editing on nonlinear linear editing systems and other people started following from film to the nonlinear editing systems. I think we're at another crossroads. If we look at the change that's gone from CS5 to to Premiere Pro 6, you can see that they are going more and more towards the interface that is already there with Final Cut Pro 10. And I think what's going to happen is those people that are used to and using this is the way that things are going to be edited in the future. And those people who are uncomfortable with changing over are going to be left behind. The way that Final Cut Pro 6 and 7 did it, the way that Premiere still does it, I think is something that is going to slowly and slowly fade away in favor of the way that Final Cut Pro 10 does it. And that is why I'm going to recommend this as our cho choice to go forward with at PNCA.
If you have any questions, thank you for listening. I know this has been a very, very long demo. If you have any questions or any comments or anything that you'd like to talk about, please let me know. Thank you for watching. I really, really do value your recommendations and your input on this. Have a great day.